Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Eric Bassett, a senior partner with Mercer in charge of our affinity and association business. Also joining me today is Robin J. Suthausen, who is a, a leader in our affinity business, also a senior partner, and the author of three, three books on the change in nature of work. Robin, the nature of work is changing. We see it every day in the news. Um, we see it internally at the work that we do at Mercer. What are some of the key drivers of that today? Why is it spiking? Why is it becoming so prevalent? Yeah, Eric, it's great to be here with you. Um, it has been really fascinating to see how the gig economy has changed over the course of the last several years. You know, prior to the pandemic, we saw steady increases in the use of gig workers in the corporate environment, so kind of the B2B model. Um, with the pandemic, we saw a bit of a dip in the use of corporates, uh, corporates use of gig talent because businesses prioritized uh, protecting their employees, but we saw a massive spike in the use of gig workers on the B2C side of things. As you know, we were all staying home, we were looking for food to be delivered, we were looking for other services. Um, and so we, we did see on the consumer side of things, a massive spike. And there is, you know, it, it, it's frankly quite logical, Eric, if you think about it, for the demands for, that we see just generally with society for greater flexibility, for greater agility, and gig work being incredibly attuned to delivering on some of those uh, key determinants of why people you know, select different types of work. Uh, Robin, interesting. Also one thing that we observe in surveys that we collect in interactions focus groups is that there is definitely an opinion among gig workers that it, it's a lifestyle option. They, they are looking for a different way to balance work and life um, they love their work, but they like the independence. Are, is there anything else that's sort of a driving factor there? And, and what is unique about these individuals that's creating that sort of work-life balance focus and why gig is so appealing? Yeah, Eric, I think that's a really important point. I think early on, you know, when I wrote my, my second book, Lead the Work, Navigating a World Beyond Employment, when we were writing that book, it certainly seemed like there was a sentiment um, that gig workers were different and they were unique. Um, I actually think we have really grown better to understand how important flexibility is to all of us. Um, and the challenges of traditional employment getting in the way. We, we see flexibility be really becoming the hallmark of the New Deal. And I think it's why you see more and more organizations recognizing that they need to inject flexibility because there are large swaths of that population who now are recognizing that as we come through this pandemic, that flexibility is a greater option. And, you know, gig work is ideally suited to providing that flexibility. It also provides the variability of work that we see lots of talent demanding because you're not doing the same thing over and over. Every transaction, every work experience is so incredibly unique, whether it's who you're working with and increasingly also what you're doing. It's, it's interesting as we talk with employers of contractors, gig workers, on-demand workers, however you want to term the, the phrase, we, we often find that within an organization, within a company, a corporation, there's sometimes indecision as to who has responsibility for these individuals. Sometimes it's in like a purchasing function. Um, sometimes it's within the, the different business units. And it's not always on the CHRO's radar screen. Um, sometimes even HR has very little involvement. In what, is the, what is the best practice in that? You know, should a CHRO be interested in this space? Um, if so, why and how do they sort of get get control of it and, and deliver for the organization. Eric, you're absolutely right. CHROs do need to be paying attention to the gig workers. And, and let me give you a little bit of context. We're seeing across every business model, organizations tapping into multiple sources of work. It could be employees, it could be contractors, it could be use of automation, and certainly gig workers are a key element of those choices. And what we're seeing organizations focus on is a more resilient model. 
where work can be deployed more seamlessly to these various options. Progressive CHROs recognize that their role is shifting from being a steward of employment to being a steward of work. And what that means is that they, they need to manage all aspects of the work experience of everyone who contributes to the mission of the organization. And so we're seeing, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, a CHRO who was, uh, who had traditionally been focused on, on the employee population, looking out across all of these different sources and saying to procurement, you might manage the mechanics of contracting with contractors or gig workers, but we in HR absolutely need to own their experience. We need to own how they're connected to the mission and purpose of this organization because they are representing our brand, either to our employees or to our customers. And so that CHRO then took the opportunity to own the experience of all of the gig workers who the organization was employed, was, was contracting with. Equally, I had a tech company CHRO say to me, you know, we use 3,500 contractors and gig workers every day. She tongue in cheek said, our employees might choose us because of the free food, but those gig workers and contractors choose us every day. They've got a myriad of choices from other organizations in the tech sector and elsewhere. How do I ensure that we have a relationship with them, that it's not a transaction? How do I make sure that the next time we need them, they choose us? And that, that I think is where we're seeing the progressive HR functions go is recognize that the gig workforce is a pivotal part of how the, execu the organization executes its business model. And that talent needs to be actively managed and a very clear value proposition articulated for that talent. Robin, as, as you talk about um, why this is important to a CHRO, if we got a little bit more tactical, many of the things that you discuss, for instance, you mentioned every day a gig worker chooses us, chooses their employer because they're not an everyday employee, right? They have a choice of who they work for, when they work for them. And that choice could change almost daily. But if you go to another tactical level, you know, it's, it's all about sort of attracting and retaining those critical gig workers. Are there any, you know, basic tactics around that? You know, obviously the work environment is, and the flexibility sort of comes with that gig world. But what else are employers of gig or contract workers doing to to complete that loyalty loop, to have that individual choose them each day? Yeah, Eric, I think that's a great question. And it's frankly where we've seen in the last two years, um, a lot of action um, as organizations have looked to transcend, transcend the transactional. We've seen organizations focus on um, providing benefits that in the past they might not have provided to, uh, to such gig workers. We've seen organizations be much more deliberate in recognizing that they need to manage the work experience of this talent in much the same way that they manage the work experience of their employees. So ensuring that all of this talent has a consistent experience and it's not left to the vagaries of individual managers. Um, you know, things as may, this may seem simple and trite, but that CHRO that I just talked about saying, we're inviting our contract workers to the company picnic. You know, it's a chance for that gig worker who's worked with you as a manager to actually meet you in person and to meet your wife and kids. And it's those sort of connections um, that enable you to transcend the transactional. And so it's managing the entire work experience. But I do think the benefit side of the equation is, is where we're seeing the opportunity for a lot more action and, and progressive thought. Your comments about including uh, gig workers, for instance, at the company picnic make perfect sense. We are seeing in discussions with um, employers of large gig or contract populations that their own employees, their true employees, have sort of a, a social conscious around Johnny and Susie that sit next to me that may be a contractor. We want them to have the same things that we have as full-time employees. And that's been a very interesting trend that I don't think has been there uh, traditionally. Are, are you seeing that as well? Yeah, we, we certainly are, Eric. And I think this is where it, 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 become, it gets quite interesting because A, it requires organizations to 
in treating their gig workers with equity. There's a reason why those gig workers are gig workers and they're working alongside Johnny and Susie who are employees, but maybe not necessarily doing the same things. Um, but there's a reason why they, they're gig workers, and it's both because of company need as well as the choice of those gig workers. So I do think there is a need for ensuring that there is more equity. But I think at the same time, it's important that organizations manage the nuances and ensure that equity doesn't mean uh, complete sameness or, uh, or complete sort of equality, for want of a better phrase, because there are some unique constraints, as, as you well know, Eric, with employees versus gig workers. But the important thing is that both of those are pivotal segments of the workforce and their unique needs need to be addressed uh, by all organizations. One last question to wrap up our discussion, Robin. Um, organizations who are hiring gig populations sometimes are sourcing those gig workers themselves. Sometimes they're using sort of on-demand uh, mediators, sort of, you know, in between organizations, you might hate to say it, but almost like a wholesaler that's aggregating many different gig workers and presenting those to an organization. So I can see how you can make the experience and the action and retention issues work well when you're sourcing it all yourself. Are there any special twists to consider when you're using an aggregator or an on-demand platform to source the work? Yeah, Eric, that's a really good question. Um, I, I do think um, there are some, some options here. Certainly, as you've alluded to, you don't have the full control that you would have if you were contracting with Jim or Sally on your own, but rather now they are part of a pool. I do think it's important that even if that, that individual is part of a broader pool, there is a mechanism through which you can make sure that that person appreciates the unique unique work experience that they're now in today because they work for your organization. Um, so I think ensuring that you build a relationship with that person, particularly when that person demonstrates some real value and you, you know that this is someone you want to keep engaging with. I think equally, the you are an important customer for that managed services provider or that platform. I think you you as an organization have an opportunity to engage that third party in ensuring that they are providing and treating their gig workers at a level that you would expect to to be treating yours at as well. So you have um, an opportunity to exert some influence uh, on that third party as well. Robin, thanks for your comments today. Um, we, we know quite well as we began this conversation that this is a, a growing area, um, the nature of work the traditional employee-employer relationship is definitely changing, and it's a global issue. Um, I believe recently I noticed in one article by Statistics, there will be roughly about $450 billion U.S. dollars spent globally in the gig and contract workforce by 2023. And it represents a growth of roughly 13% per year, which we believe will continue for the foreseeable future. Um, the comments you made around um, sort of that attraction and retention aspect, creating a valuable relationship, loyalty loop, there are a lot of ways to, um, to, to describe that are so important. And from a standpoint of HR professionals, we, we have to get involved. We have to be involved. We have to have the right plan. We have to have a, a course of action that creates that affinity with this workforce, whether we're sourcing it ourselves or sourcing it using an external platform. Um, so thanks again for your help. Um, and we look forward to talking about this more. We will be publishing um, some information on this that will be included um, as this video closes. Um, please feel free to reach out to uh, myself or Robin with any questions. And we look forward to talking to you.